I'm Tom Dwelly. I flew 270 fighter bomber missions in the big Douglas A1E Sky Raider in Vietnam in 1965. This is my story. This is a Douglas A1E Sky Raider, weighs 25,000 pounds. We had a hundred of these starting in uh, February 1965. We lost, uh, I think, 28 um, when I was there, 33 guys dead. I was part of the 602nd Air Commando Squadron, and uh, we carried a lot of ordnance. I had a gun camera pod. They made a camera pod for me. Um, uh, I flew with a Nikon around my neck all the time, flew with Larry Burroughs from Life Magazine, and so they built a camera pod, and we'll get to that in a minute. This is a Vietnamese Air Force loading bombs uh, uh, for our Sky Raiders. Um, these are a couple of 500-pound uh, bombs, and um, they load off the trailer, and then you put it on an MJ-1 machine, a bomb loader, um, and then you drive it right under the airplane and then hook it up and latch it in. And, and I always drove the, the, the J machine. I got a big kick out of that. I got as good as any of these guys, uh, the, the rocket cockers or gun plumbers, as we call them. That's the sergeant who's, who's uh, training the Vietnamese. And um, uh, we had quite a, quite a training program. Vietnamese had their own uh, Sky Raiders. Uh, but uh, uh, we, uh, we had ours, they were different, but uh, uh, in this case, uh, it looks like a training session. That's not tight enough, guys. Uh, that's a nose fuse there. Now they're gonna screw in a nose fuse, has a, a propeller on it with a wire, okay? You drop the bomb and, and the wire comes out, the propeller turns, and then the bomb arms. That way the bomb doesn't go off immediately under your airplane. We had 15 stations, uh, six on each side, uh, and one in the middle, 30, 500 pounds. The two stubs, uh, left and right, 2,200 pounds. On the outboard stations, every other one was a 500-pounder. This is 20-millimeter high-explosive ammunition, and we never had gun problems. The guys were phenomenal. Here they're going over every round, uh, oiling it slightly, and we never, ever had gun problems. In later years, uh, they couldn't make the guns work at all. They were exploding in the breach and, and lost a couple of airplanes because of that. But these kids working uh, day and night, making sure the alignment is good. And um, uh, every fifth one was a tracer. And uh, high explosive and high explosive incendiary. It's a napalm bomb. In the front is a white phosphorus grenade. And uh, uh, when, the, uh, when, the, when the bomb hits, it's jelly gasoline, and then the uh, white phosphorus grenade, grenade goes off. Sometimes you'll see it flying way up in the air, and, uh, and white phosphorus is something else. This uh, uh, young captain is doing a pre-flight there. He's uh, looking at things that... Uh, that we always looked at. I always pushed on the wingtip. These were Navy aircraft, and you know, the wings fold up, and that, I always uh, uh, was concerned about that. Uh, you have ways of checking that the wings are down and locked, but I always pushed up on the wingtip. Okay, he's getting in, he's strapping in now. This is the, um, the uh, uh, standard seat. We didn't have ejection seats during this time, and we never used oxygen. We had uh, a boom mask, and um, everything's ready to go. He's happy. Uh, 16 blades, and turn the mags on and start bumping the primer, and it lights off. Here's a flight of four. Uh, typically, we had two bombers and two napalmers. We always dropped bombs first and then napalm, okay, and then finally strafe. You never went in and dropped napalm or strafed except in, a, in an emergency situation. Uh, you, never, you never went in low uh, without bombing first, otherwise um, uh, it could turn out badly for you. Here's the pre-flight out on the end of the runway check-in. We had four different radios and it was quite a fright. 
especially for new guys to check in on on VHF, uh, UHF, FM, and and another um, a radio that we had uh, a, a, a single sideband. Line up on the runway now, and we're going to roll and roll and roll. Airplane lifts off at about a hundred knots, and um, and we're turning and burning now. Off the runway, gear up, check the flaps, look for lead, and start the join up. Okay, lead will start a turn, two will join on the inside, three on the outside, and number four all the way on the outside. So they're, they're just uh, getting lined up now. And again, uh, when we bombed, a uh, lead would go in. Uh, uh, with the lead and two were bombers and three and four were uh, napalmers and uh, so lead would go in and drop uh, a bomb or two and then a napalmer would come the other way opposite uh, and then uh, um, a two would go in and drop a bomb uh, and then uh, a four would come in opposite directions so uh, they never knew which way we were uh, we were coming from uh, once we started strafing, um, it's uh, it's uh, we'd start a big wheel where we'd have somebody uh, uh, shooting at the target at all times. That worked especially well in North Vietnam when we're trying to protect the helicopters. He's on a bomb pass now, and the bomb's coming off there. That's wrong. That's a gun pass. You can see the smoke uh, coming out the back. Four. Uh, um, M4 20 millimeter cannons um, and you nearly observed a midair there and you can see all four cannons firing simultaneously at 50 rounds a second that's half the speed of the Gatling gun uh, that we had in the F4 in the Phantom and uh, we have a, a chase plane here again we're strafing uh, there's a lot of brass coming out the back, like I say, 50 rounds a second, and you learn real quick. You don't get into that brass because it beats the hell out of the airplane, and uh, it makes the ground crew unhappy to have dents in the in the leading edge. And uh, so you can see that I'm flying off to the off to the side a little bit. We're going to see some heavy, I mean, heavy brass coming out the back. We're uh, Empty now, Winchester, um, had it get joined up and headed back home. We had 150 gallons of centerline fill. We burned that up in uh, 14 minutes climbing out. We're going to see the bomb selector now. I can still remember uh, 111, 3957. You could drop them in singles or in pairs. The pipes out in the front's called a daisy cutter. In the early years, we, we had a, a worn out gun barrel and we had lots of those. You welded onto a shipping plug and you screw it into the front of a bomb um, uh, in place of the fuse. Uh, and then when the uh, pipe hits the ground, it sets the bomb off three, three feet in the air. And of course, in this instance, you would have uh, a tail fuse set on instantaneous rather than a tenth of a second as a backup. There's the weapon selector. He's holding the button down now. 1113957. After all these years I can still remember uh, the the uh, release order. 111. You, you, you drop one from uh, obviously first uh, the left side of the wing and then the right, left, right, left, right. You don't want to drop them all from one side. That's in, almost impossible to do. Uh, but you have a built-in turn, and, and you don't need that. Here's the join up now, and uh, a little bit of overshoot almost. Daisy cutters in later years were uh, were uh, uh, a manufactured thing which came over from the states. We're looking at a dive bomb pass here now. That's a good stick. Looks like you got something on the third bomb there. And uh, the Kong moved everything by by uh, um, raft, by, by a sampan. And I'm telling you, we strafed a lot of, 
a Tukong uh, uh, pulling a sampan 40 knots. <laughs> Not quite, but they're real good at this. This is napalm now and white phosphorus. I had a, a gun camera, uh, a pod made out of a napalm can with 16 millimeter uh, uh, camera looking forward and aft, and also 35 millimeter uh, a camera looking forward and aft. So as I roll in on a target, I'd hit the rocket button up on top of the stick. Watch this now. This is a guy flying right behind me, and we're going to see a napalm can come off the right wing. This is a very unusual shot. Nobody ever got one like this. I mean, why would you? This is crazy stuff. Uh, you can get your ass shot down doing this, but it was a fairly uh, benign area, and, and we had uh, softened it up first. And uh, that, that's that's amazing. So so you, you start the cameras going, the nose cameras, and then as you pickle off bombs or napalm, whatever, the rear cameras start up, and that's what you're seeing here. Oh, that's a hung bomb. It, it tried to get hung up, and, uh, and it... Uh, it's weighed, and uh, that's white phosphorus. That stuff is nasty. Burns at 1,600 degrees. Boy, that'll bring them out of their foxholes, I'll tell you. That was a real big aid at night uh, in, in a close air support battle. Most of our stuff was close air support, troops in contact. Uh, this is, uh, oh, this looks like a rubber plantation here. Uh, yeah, it is. The Kong knew the French. Uh, uh, French had rubber everywhere. It was uh, it was that they were using it to make tires, and uh, we couldn't bomb in in the rubber. It was it was uh, uh, off limits. Yeah, that's uh, rubber from Michelin, Michelin farms, and uh, uh, guess what? That's where the Kong. Uh, uh, hid their stuff out in the rubber. Boy, we surprised them one night. Un unexpectedly, we got clearance to go into the rubber, and boy, what a fright that was. It looked like the best Fourth of July you've ever seen. I don't get a kick out of Fourth of July anymore. Uh, uh, it's uh, had about enough of that uh, when I was there. Um, a lot of stuff we did, especially at night, was to protect... Hey, uh, here's another rare-looking napalm shot again, and, and white phosphorus. That's spectacular stuff. Jelly gasoline lit off by... Uh, uh, there, there goes a, a, a grenade. It's blown right out the front. A white phosphorus grenade. Sometimes you drop a napalm can, and it didn't go off, so you could come back and strafe it. And... Uh, and get a good secondary explosion. That was always a lot of fun. You can always find some way to entertain yourself, you know. But you got to be very careful. You can you can live out on the edge, but you can't make any mistakes. You can't ever make any mistakes. I know we saw it happen all the time. There's some more rubber. Don't do that. Here's another rear shot. I turned on the rear camera, and somebody's following me. Again, he didn't like, I lined him up on a target, and he didn't like that, so he's going to start a little bit of a left turn there, and uh, we're going to see that napalm can come off with luck. I didn't like what I was seeing ahead of me, so I pulled up and missed it. I had, I think, 10 missions with this pod, this camera pod, and that, and that was great fun because... Um, They'd call me from Saigon when the um, when the uh, uh, film came back from Hawaii, from Kodak in Hawaii. They call me and I go down there, and uh, and this film came off the cutting room floor. They take all the best stuff, so this is crap off the cutting room floor. And I came back back with a huge reel of that. Finally, I said, "Come on, guys, you're taking all the good stuff. Give me some of that." And and the one of that bomb falling off. I don't think they really appreciated the gravity or, or the uniqueness of that one, so I didn't say anything. I just spliced it into my into my own reel. I had my own a system down there in a big reel, and they gave me complete access. Don't fly through the cloud. 
Ah, <clears throat> okay. We know there's no parts of a locomotive in that cloud, so uh, it's pretty safe. Here's a low altitude uh, uh, strike, and again, they will have bombed already. We can cut this stuff out, George. That'd be good. Looks like we got some structures burning there. I'm going after something here. I don't remember. You know, I can remember every one of my 270 missions. Um, I wish I'd kept better notes. Uh, we didn't dare uh, uh, plot a map and carry it with us because, you know, we're losing so many guys. Uh, if you get captured and they're going to find dots all over your map, that, that could turn out badly for you. There again, this is proximity to a, to a clone or, or a, a canal. That's how they move their stuff. Down in the Kamau Peninsula, down south of uh, uh, Loch Nen, down in the Kamau Peninsula, Kento, a lot of action down there, because the Kong would uh, would float 55 gallon drums down the Mekong River, three quarters uh, of the way, uh, with fuel. Fuel is is lighter than gasoline, so it, it was going to float anyway to the top. Um, but uh, with air in in the in the 25 percent of a 55 gallon drum, they'd float those down the down the Mekong River at night and police them up downstream. Here following a napalmer this time. Oops, we got something there. At night sometimes you could sneak up on the Kong. We, we, could, we knew where they were working because the RF uh, one uh, on would fly infrared photography at night, uh, and then we could tell where they were sleeping, and and when they ate. And we learned we learned to do that. We we studied that so much during our counterinsurgency training that you know when they travel, how they travel, how they eat, when they eat, what uh, how close to water. Uh, do they camp, et cetera, et cetera. Pretty soon we became the enemy. I mean, you have to think like an enemy. You have to become one. And then it's pretty easy to judge what they're going to do next. So we were particularly effective. And, and with this big old Douglas Sky Raider, you know, we I used to laugh and say we'd taxi, climb, glide, strafe, bomb, 160 knots. <laughs> Actually, uh, we went to and from the target at 160 knots. And um, uh, but uh, down uh, when you're bombing, you get up to around a 350 or a 360. You always you always had to be predictable in, in your dive angle and your dive speed. Otherwise, too fast the bomb goes long. If you're too slow, the bomb falls short. Or if you're flat, the bomb falls short. Or if you're too steep on a dive bomb pass, the bomb goes long. 12 o'clock. Uh, unscorable at 12, so uh, it, it was quite an art. We didn't have any fancy uh, lead computing sites or radar sites like we had later, but this was just like World War II. I mean, the last, the good old World War II flying. It was fabulous. Looks like we're going to do a gun pass here now. I see stations, but no armament. Now we did, there's, there's armament coming off. There's two more. Okay, stay with it, Tom, stay with it. Don't chicken out. Oh, I chickened out <laughs> or ran out of film. Here's a join up. Looks like it's going to be exciting. <laughs> yeah, you can slip behind there. There now, boy. I could, 
I always loved flying formation. I mean, we flew like the Thunderbirds all the time. It was easy to do. And uh, I could take off as number four with a fully loaded airplane and be the first one in formation. Uh, and there's a strafe pass. You see the you see the smoke? That's 50 rounds a second coming out of the front. We had four of these 20 millimeter cannons. There's the brass coming out the back. I picked that up with my rear camera. So you can imagine what that does to an airplane. It goes like that. And it just beats the heck out of the airplane. Another gun pass. Steady, steady, steady. Don't see the rounds hit there. Pull up and turn immediately. If you're strafing out over the water, that's extremely dangerous. You know, if you're strafing sandpans, that's a lot of fun. But, you know, if you, if you watch you get close enough to really be accurate, um, 12 or, or, or 1,500 feet. And if you watch the rounds hit, you're going in with the rounds. You're going in. And I almost did that one time. Everybody almost does that one time. Uh, but you pull up, you got to pull up and turn because the ricochets will bounce off the water on a 30-degree gun pass, 30-degree dive angle gun pass. The bullets... The rounds would ricochet off the water, and it can shoot you down. Some of the guys would come back with cannon shells, uh, uh, frag bombs. Whoa, you're too low, buddy. That's a gun pass. He was after something. Vietnam was no place to be unless you wanted to be there. But at this point, I'd been a fighter pilot for four, five, six years, including training, and, uh, and we trained to do this, and I could hardly wait, man. I was going to be go over there, and I was going to be Sky King and Steve Canyon, and I was going to, I was going to, by God, win the war, and, and happy to do it, and, and pretty much everybody uh, felt the same way. You know, we're a band of brothers. You talk about band of brothers. Um, it, it really is true. It really is true, and the guys who, who didn't want to be there didn't last very long. Uh, I don't care what you're doing. Uh, uh, the guys that got shot down, um, um, you're going to get it. It, it. It's just going to happen because we had so much gunfire, so much, so many hits. We had a we had a joke. When we were up country at Queen Yon, up in the middle of uh, South Vietnam, on the coast there, beautiful area, uh, we said, "Well, you get hits, rounds coming up through the bottom of the wing, and when you have, uh, we used to tape the wing with what we called uh, green tape, supersonic tape. If you can see more tape than you can aluminum, then it's time to send the airplane back to Benoit." Uh, and north of Saigon and get us another airplane, man. This one's living on unborrowed time. So, you know, you can always find something to entertain yourself with. Here's the dive bomb pass. Yeah, he's going to get that house. Boom. No, I'm not going to follow the bomb down. Quiet. You can see the flash. Pull out, Tom. Well, maybe I was probably strafing myself at that point. Like I say, I flew 10 missions uh, doing this, and all the film that you see today in the, in the uh, Hollywood's movies is stuff that I shot. Um, Deer Hunter and, and uh, uh, I forget the, the ones, but this kind of stuff here, it's exactly like this. And I was there, man. And... Uh, if you didn't want to be there, uh, it was no place to be. I feel sorry about the guys that got drafted and forced out into the jungle, and and uh, you know that's terrible. That was uh, that was not good. I'm not in favor of the draft in, in a situation like this. Although um, we were trying to outdo the the Chinese and the Vietnamese in, in a war of attrition. And the only way you can do that is by, by uh, um, uh, conscripting kids 
and teaching them to fight and send them off to war. But they didn't want to be there. And, uh, and like I say, that's no place to be unless you want to be there because you had to stay ahead of the fight. You had to lead the fight all the time. That's good stuff here. Looks like he dropped his bombs in pairs. Up, 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 now turn. And again, you could you could drop a bomb down in the in the delta, down in the water, or down in the clay, and if it uh, with a delay fuse, and then it shoot right straight back up at you like a cannon shell. So we we pulled up. Uh, to avoid the shrapnel and turn. Turn, turn. I had uh, a big roll of my own gun camera film and uh, it got away from me. The day I left, I went to get my big roll of film, uh, you know, stuff from the 16 millimeter camera that we had on every one of the airplanes uh, and it was missing and the uh, the crew uh, the camera crew said well the office of air force history came and got it and uh, that's a real shame because I went straight to the office of air force history and they said no we didn't get your film we don't have it here's another napalm shot that's rubber Look at all the rubber there, wow. That's a hundred pound white phosphorus bomb that, that makes all the big um, uh, trails there. We carried two of those on night alert. We always had a couple of hundred pound white phosphorus bombs because at night we weren't supposed to bomb or fight or whatever uh, without a flare ship. But you know, when uh, when one when a, a, a village or a special forces uh, combat uh, a fort was under attack, man, we got there as quick as we could, and and they would uh, we talked to them on the radio, and they'd tell us. Uh, where the threat was, which direction, and uh, sometimes uh, if it was a Vietnamese fort and we couldn't understand them, they, they had called a fire arrow. It was a big giant arrow, maybe 20 feet long, and it had uh, a big coffee cans full of uh, diesel fuel uh, in the shape of an arrow, and it was rotate 360 degrees, and they would turn that thing around and, and point it at the threat, and so we get down low, and we could see that um, uh, where they were. I mean, it's real easy to spot a mortar, uh, a pit, and uh, they didn't like uh, they didn't like uh, that. Uh, my favorite tactic was to uh, uh, typically two mortar pits. I'd put one white phosphorus in in the first mortar pit, and the second one uh, just skip bomb the second one. And then have uh, have my partner John Larison in many cases, or or Ish Ingram come the other way with a stick of frag bombs, and boy, the party's over, man, at that point, and and that's pretty hairy stuff. We used to swap, uh, uh, like I'd go in uh, with lights on and pick a target, and uh, and strafe or bomb whatever, and uh, John would call me and say. I got my target, and so I turn off the turn off my lights and turn, and boy, the rounds would come up where I just was, and then he'd pick a target uh, and strafe, and then with his lights on, so we'd flip flop back and forth, and that's crazy stuff. That's crazy stuff, but it worked, and you can do that with this kind of an airplane. You can't do it with jets. I know, I've seen it all. I went back later flying the, the Phantom F-4 Phantom out of Thailand, and uh, it was a whole different war. When you're going downtown, they talk about going downtown. That means to, to uh, Hanoi. I never got to go downtown uh, uh, in the Phantom. Uh, let me rephrase that. I never had to go 
downtown in the Phantom uh, because the war was pretty much over except for the the Mayaguez thing that uh, that we got wrapped in, up in at the, at the very end. Um, but, uh, you know, the guys went north, one pass, haul ass, and uh, uh, like the colonel said, uh, Dwelly, you better get your bombs on target because if you miss, you get to go back tomorrow, and guess what? They're going to be waiting for you, and they're pissed. Again, I'm Tom Dwelly. I'm happy to be here, and... Uh, it was a lot of fun, but we were we were bulletproof. Thank God for that. And it was um, it was exhausting. It was absolutely exhausting. We didn't have time to to worry about killing Migs or or that kind of stuff. Although I did have Migs all over me one time, but fortunately they didn't see me. So again, uh, I'm back. Everybody's safe, as far as I know. It's a happy day. Fourth of July is coming up. Thank you, George. Thank you, buddy.